Uh, it's a pleasure to have everybody uh, join us for the monthly Target 2035 sort of walk through chemical biology. And today we're going to be hearing about targeted protein degradation and how one can tackle potentially proteins that aren't amenable to traditional small molecule approaches. Um, I'm to remind you that if you have questions during the, the, um, the talks today at the Q&A box at the bottom right there of your Zoom screen, you'll be able to just plug them in and we'll actively monitor them. Uh, this will be recorded so you can uh, also listen in and use it as a podcast. Um, and the, uh, I'd really like to thank uh, Emery and the, uh, the BDCI, which is a chemical biology, chemistry, med chem uh, organization there uh, for hosting this. And, and for Callie for stepping in here and doing all the introductions and managing the show today, really, really appreciate it. And the, and the more folks that uh, join this effort, the better. So thanks for joining. Thanks for organizing and over to you. Thank you so much. Um, like Al said, my name is Callie Wigington. I'm the managing director of the Biological Discovery Through Chemical Innovation Initiative here at Emory University. We refer to it as BDCI, that's much easier to say. And broadly, BDCI is an effort to drive cross-disciplinary collaborations here at Emory, um, specifically at the chemistry biology interface, which is where we know that a lot of drug discovery and development happens. And so, um, so much of what we do is focused on our Emory investigators, but we also do like to look outwards and look towards the broader chemical biology community and make connections and learn from people all over the world. So we were really thrilled to be able to help organize this webinar on such an exciting topic and recruit some really, you know, um, rising stars in this area. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first speaker today. Um, his name is George Winter. He's the principal investigator at CEMM, as well as co-founder of the biotech companies Proxygen and Soulgate. In his lab at CEMM, he's focusing on targeted protein degradation and especially on molecular glue degraders as these molecules cause the complete elimination of harmful proteins and constitute a new avenue towards targeting proteins that were previously considered undruggable. His lab connects basic research and gene regulation and the ubiquitin proteasome system with functional genomics and chemical probe development to develop novel and personalized therapeutic paradigms. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, George. Thank you very much, Kelly, for this uh, very kind introduction. Let me just share my screen. Let's hope everything works as exercised. Can I briefly let me know if you see everything? Fine? Yes, everything is fine. Good. All right, then let's get started. These are just briefly my conflict of interest. And uh, yeah, in order to set the stage briefly for my talk and also the next talk, uh, I just want to quickly review uh, the principles of targeted protein degradation. So this is a, a novel pharmacology that is geared to eliminate uh, target proteins via the ubiquitin proteasome system. The, uh, it's a pharmacology that depends on small molecules that recruit proteins of interest to uh, E3 ubiquitin ligases to prompt their polyubiquitination and ensuing degradation. While the focus of both of today's talks will be on either Proltex, a molecule that you see sketched out here, or molecular glues, uh, it's also fair to say that there is a continuous evolution um, in novel modalities such as Litex, Etex, Altex, <laughs> that are basically geared to hijack other ubiquitin or other protein turnover or protein disposal systems in order to get rid of uh, disease causing proteins. Um, the Pharmacology of targeted protein degradation has a couple of very distinct and unique advantages. Um, we, it allows us to really uh, achieve complete target ablation that also targets non-enzymatic protein function. It has catalytic turnover. That means that the single equivalent of small molecule can induce the, the clearance, the degradation of multiple equivalents of protein. Um, there's an extended duration of drug effect. Uh, this means that even after washout of the degrader, the system is still without functioning protein for a while until that compensatory protein synthesis has set in. Um, we and others in the field have shown that uh, turning a, an inhibitor or a binder into a degrader uh, provides a certain, um, a certain um, 
measure to increase selectivity of a degrader. Uh, and finally, and this is probably the most important bullet point that uh, small molecule degraders allow, allow us to the pursuit of proteins that are otherwise considered undruggable uh, in this inhibitor centric mindset. Uh, for Protex, as seen here, this basically means that instead of asking a small molecule to bind to a protein of interest and inhibit a particular function, we just need to bind it. Uh, and once we, once we can bind it with one warhead, as illustrated here, then we can drag it to an E3 ubiquitin ligase to ensue its, uh, its ubiquitination degradation by the proteasome. That still means that fundamentally, this dual binding paradigm that this uh, underlying protect development really means that we still need to be able to ligand these proteins of interest. Well, unfortunately, for many of the proteins that uh, my lab fundamentally cares about, such as transcription factors, this is not a very trivial task. Uh, there is many proteins that we still consider unligandable because they are intrinsically disordered. And this is why we are so particularly excited about uh, um, molecular glue degraders, because we believe that they also allow us to uh, degrade proteins that would otherwise be considered unligandable. So just the bullet points <coughs> that make up a molecular glue degrader, a glue, orchestrates protein-protein interactions that lead to a highly cooperative binding event, which means that you, need, you don't need a pocket on or affinity for the target that, you're, uh, that you are degrading, uh, therefore meaning that you can also degrade unligandable protein. Uh, molecular glue degraders are monovalent, meaning they are much smaller, they are more drug-like compared to a protein, and they're also clinically uh, validated, as exemplified here uh, by this molecule, uh, lenalidomide, also called Revlimid. So quickly, uh, how, how that uh, lenalidomide, how that small molecule works is that it binds to uh, the cerebellum E3 ligase, which is a substrate receptor of a culling ring ligase complex. The binding event complements a, a hydrophobic surface patch that is then sufficient to recruit uh, different zinc finger transcription factors, such as Icarus 1, Icarus 3, both proteins that would uh, classically be considered unligandable and undruggable. That recruitment induces polyubiquitination and degradation by the proteasome. Importantly, without lenalidomide itself having any measurable affinity uh, to those uh, zinc finger transcription factors. The problem in the field that, uh, that has uh, existed is that molecular glue degraders have been only serendipitously identified. Nobody has designed lenalidomide to really fulfill that molecular pharmacology that we see here sketched out. And they have been perceived to be relatively rare. And, and these are things that my lab uh, set out to, to change and to tackle. Uh, and one very important experiment or sets of experiments that we have uh, uh, done initially is, is uh, outlined here, where we basically took five different small molecule degraders, both Protex and molecular glues, and performed genome-wide CRISPR screens, basically asking for uh, what, which genes in a cell need to be active in order for these small molecule degraders to work. And, and we worked through uh, different uh, genes, but we really uh, grew fond of one particular gene called UB2M here. And this is work uh, that has been uh, uh, very masterfully executed by Christina uh, mayer Roos, who is now leading her own lab at IRB in Barcelona. So what is UB2M doing? Uh, UB2M is, uh, is an enzyme that is involved in, the, in a post-translation modification of these cullen ring ligases. This is the largest family of E3 ligases encoded in the human genome. And it basically is involved in, a, in this process called nedylation. So it, uh, nedylation is a post-translation modification that happens on these cullen backbones, turning an inactive ligase complex into an active ligase complex. So we could show that with a single mutation in this master regulator, UB2M, we do see uh, abrogated activity of all culling backbone with the exception of, of culling 5. Uh, integrating this biochemical profiling data uh, with uh, gene expression data in this particular cell line, this is a near haploid human uh, cancer cell line called KBM7, let us to hypothesize that with that single mutation in UB2M, <coughs> we can inactivate more than 200 different culling ring ligase assemblies. Um, so what can we do with these hyponatylated cells? Uh, we can go back to our screening data and really ask the question, is it true that mutation of UB2M, because it consequentially inactivates the ligase, so it should also cause resistance to known degraders? And this is exactly what we've seen here, uh, exemplified with a bed protein called DBET6. Mutation of UB2M, you see uh, an almost 500-fold shift towards more resistant uh, to that small molecule. So we then ask the question when, if this mutation in that 
single gene causes resistance to all known degraders, maybe we can turn that question around. Uh, and search for new degraders simply by searching for molecules that lose activity in this UB2 uh, uh, mutant background. And that's exactly what we did here with a very simple readout of just cell viability, uh, profiling around 2,000 small molecules. And, and you see that there's a couple of molecules that were very effective in killing wild type cells, yet lost all their activity in this UB2 mutant background. <clears throat> all of those molecules validated in those ranging assays. Um, and the first molecule, while uh, not particularly pleasing from a chemical standpoint, uh, it had this aryl sulfonamide structure, uh, which we um, could later on show acts basically as a molecular glue degrader to uh, reprogram a, a, an E3 ligase called DK15 in order to induce the degradation of a splicing factor called RBM39. And um, we were guided here by this very seminal work by Deepak Nichawan, uh, published in, in 2017 in, in Science on a chemically related uh, aryl sulfonamide called indisulam. So we were more interested in really trying to understand what these other molecules are doing here, uh, shown in the structure called DSM2, 3, and 4. Uh, and in order to really both identify what might be proteins that are degraded and what is the E3 ligase that degrades these proteins. We set out to do a, a bunch of different omics experiments that I'm going to quickly guide you through. Uh, starting with expression proteomics, where we just treated KBM7 cells for five hours with these different small molecule degraders and asked the question on a proteome wide scale, what are the proteins that are destabilized after drug treatment? Uh, and in each of those cases, to our surprise, uh, we always found one particular protein, cycling K, to be the most destabilized protein. I say to our surprise because particularly between DSM2 and DSM4, there was no real um, obvious uh, chemical similarity that we could, uh, we could uh, observe. Um, in all of these cases, we could again validate this destabilization of cycling K in, in time-ranging Western plots, showing that already one hour after ligand exposure, we see very profound destabilization of cycling K. <clears throat> we could show with different chemical controls that this is a degradation that really works via the uh, via ubiquitin proteasome system. And most importantly, we could also show that we can rescue the degradation when we block the catalytic site of CDK12. CDK12, if I can go back very quickly, is the, is the CDK that is regulated by cycling K. Uh, and so we made here use of a covalent small molecule introduced by Nathaniel Gray's lab, uh, showing that in order for cycling K degradation to happen, our molecules likely need to engage to the active site of CDK12. Uh, we could also biochemically validate that our molecules weakly, but nevertheless do bind to uh, CDK12 and CDK13, but not to CDK7. So we were quite sure that what our molecule are degrading is cycling K. Uh, we next wanted to understand <coughs> how um, our molecules are doing that. In order to do so, we set out to do a focus CRISPR screen where we have uh, guide RNA libraries, libraries that cover every culling ring ligase uh, member and also every regulator in that kind of biology. Um, and here you see every gene that we the knockout of which conveys resistance to those degraders is, is, is highlighted and tilted to the right, right. And when we tried to make sense of that, it was very interesting to see that we almost recapitulate a, a complete a kalin ring ligase complex. We do far, find our kalin, we do find our adapter protein, DDB1. We did not find uh, our uh, substrate receptor. We did not find our cerebron or our DK15 in that particular experiment. So initially we thought maybe this is an orphan substrate receptor that was just not part of our library. We redid that entire experiment just on a genome-wide scale to basically find exactly the same genes as we have already found in this focused library. Um, so while we thought we were on, on the right track in terms of you know, what is the nature of that particular E3 ligase, we weren't quite there yet. Um, luckily, we had another chemical genetics trick up our sleeves. So what we did is basically we took wild type cells <coughs> and exposed them to, to high concentrations of our degrader, isolated in large pools, resistant cells, and subjected them uh, to a targeted resequencing, where we could resequence the, the genomic uh, loci of all of these 50 genes that we have initially uh, set out to, to uh, basically uh, connect to the uh, sensitivity of these molecules. And what was, what was very intriguing to see is that we saw a very dense clustering of point mutations in the BPC domain of these adapter protein DDB1. 
uh, once we outlined where those uh, mutations are really located, we found that they basically um, yeah, outline an entire pocket uh, on DDB1 that is also typically hijacked or has been shown to be hijacked by viral peptides, uh, he here shown with these little helis here. Uh, so that suggested that maybe what our molecules are doing is, is basically just recapitulating uh, an evolutionary conserved uh, viral pathway where viruses have shown to be basically in acting independent of a substrate receptor but directly hijacking this uh, partial ligase complex via their DDB1 adapter protein. So this will be the hypothesis of how our molecules will be operating, <coughs> binding to CDK12, inducing the proximity between CDK12 and DDB1 to then cause the ubiquitination the, driven by the E2 on this uh, on the cycling on uh, cycling K that is bound to CDK12. Um, in order to validate that, we teamed up with Nico Thomas lab at, at Basel uh, at the FMI who have uh, developed a fully recombinant uh, tier thread assay uh, between uh, that allows us to basically ask the question, does titration of our molecules induce the proximity between DDB1 and CDK12 cycling K? Uh, and this is exactly uh, what we could observe in, in, in those assays uh, on top of a little bit of a baseline affinity between uh, these two complexes. Um, so this already brings me to my uh, first conclusion slides. Uh, so I hope I could show you that this chemical profiling in the hyponatylated cells uh, is a new way to find molecular glue degraders in, the, in a targeted yet ligase agnostic fashion. Uh, we ended up with um, uh, three different small molecules that operate via this unique and, and non-obvious mechanism of action that is independent of a dedicated substrate receptor. Um, we do believe that this method of, of chemical profiling in hyponatylated cells is, is quite versatile. Uh, I've only shown it to you with this very naive setup of just screening cytotoxic molecules, but it can obviously be applied to many more different phenotypes or pathways. <clears throat> and I also want to mention that this molecular pharmacology of, of gluing CDK12 cycling K complexes to DDB1 uh, is an emerging mechanism because there were also uh, two other papers that were published right around the time when uh, we published our papers from uh, uh, Nico Thomas and Ben Eberts and Ting Hang's lab that have reported chemically different molecules uh, that basically uh, play the same trick in using the de degradation of cycling K via direct gluing of CDK12 to DDB1. In the remaining minutes uh, that I have, I want to show with share with you uh, another strategy of how we uh, believe we can find molecular glue degraders, yet not in a ligase agnostic fashion, but in a fashion where we a priori uh, predict which ligase we want to hijack. Uh, and that again brings us back to these interesting mechanisms of how Kalin ring ligases, uh, ligases are regulated in a cell. Uh, again, in Christina's earlier work, we have realized that these culinary ring ligases are incredibly dynamically regulated machines. They are basically built on, on demand and whenever they are not needed, they are actively decommissioned and put together freshly based on the needs of that a cell has in a particular moment in time. We've realized that when we perturb these ligase decommissioning by either genetically or pharmacologically inhibiting this isopeptidase called the COPS9 signalosome, which is the, the, an enzyme that typically cleaves off this uh, NET8 uh, post-translation modification from the Kalin backbone. So when we perturb this, this COPS9 signalosome, we lock a Kalin ring ligase in this very active state. Uh, so that means that the, the ligase can't disassemble. So it's continuously active, meaning that eventually what will happen is that the E2 ligase will start to ubiquitinate and degrade the substrate receptor itself. There's no substrate there, so we're degrading the substrate receptor. We also realized that when, <coughs> when we provide cells that are in this uh, COPS9 perturbed state with a glue degrader, meaning we, uh, we basically recruit new substrate to that continuously active ligase, that we divert this, this ubiquitination. We don't degrade the substrate receptor, but because now we have a substrate to degrade. And that basically causes the restabilization of the substrate receptor, here shown uh, for cerebellum. So if that's true, uh, then we basically, and this is a, a project that has been championed by Alex, a, a very talented PhD student in the lab, then basically this, in this COPS9 perturbed system, uh, substrate receptor levels are a proxy for substrate uh, uh, receptor uh, activity. 
In other words, we can basically simply search for small molecules that disrupt this self-inflicted uh, auto-degradation or this E3 ligase suicide, uh, and therefore hopefully have a good chance of finding a molecular glue degrader that brings in a new substrate. So the advantage of that assay is it's ligase agnostic, but it's open to basically the entire expressed proteome in a given cell. Uh, and I'm going to show with you a couple of slides now that I think uh, hopefully nicely illustrate a proof of concept of this. <clears throat> because we are lazy and we don't want to run hundreds of Western plots, uh, all the assays that we do here uh, typically happen with uh, a, you know, a nanoluciferase, an enzyme that maybe you'll hear more about in, in the next talk. Uh, particularly, we use this hybrid system, which is basically a split nanoluciferase assay and that allows us to trace substrate receptor level. Here I'm going to show you data on VHL in intact cell in very time uh, in a time resolved manner. So here Alex tagged endogenously VHL with Hybit uh, and basically then asked the question after I induced this ligase suicide, this auto degradation by VHL by inhibiting the COPS9 signalosome, what happens if I then titrate in different small molecules? And what was very nice to see is when he titrated in either just binders of VHL, so small molecules that bind to the substrate receptor without recruiting anything, or negative control products, nothing happens over time. The substrate receptor does not restabilize. However, when he does the same uh, experiment with active proteins that recruit new substrates to the VHL E3 ligase, we do see a very nice and time-dependent uh, restabilization, both when treating with a, a, a SMARCA24 protein or with different bad proteins. Um, we could also show that we can apply the same logic to a different ligase. Here again, turning to DK15, a ligase that I've mentioned before, which uh, induces the degradation of these splicing factors, RBM39 and RBM23. <coughs> again, with this uh, DK15, non DK15 glue degrader in this alarm, we see a very nice stabilization of DK15, which does not occur with a negative control compound. Um, and interestingly here, because we have a crystal structure, we also know that there's a particular uh, amino acid in the near substrate, uh, this glycine 260, uh, 268, that is very important for this drug-induced recruitment process. Uh, so again, when we endogenously uh, engineer this substrate in order to have a mutation, a glycine to valine mutation, which we know prevents the recruitment, uh, we also uh, prevent the restabilization, making a hopefully a convincing link between the the uh, induced recruitment of the near substrate to the destabilization, so the restabilization of the substrate receptor. We could also show that this is really a screening compatible assay um, because we, we did screen 10,000 small molecules <coughs> in our library that have this critical aerosulfonamide a feature and we I think I'm running short in time probably and um, we identified a bunch of different small molecules I can run fast. Um, and one of those molecules uh, here, so we, we find known and new molecules, one of which we could show to be also degrading RBM39. Um, it's a very clean molecule that uh, in addition to 39 only degrades RBM23. Uh, uh, and we can do all the controls showing that it really does degrade via the proteasome. Um, and with that slide, I just want to leave you with the notion that there's many uh, E3 ligases or Kalin ring ligases that undergo uh, uh, this ligase suicide uh, when we block the COPS9 signalosome. And for each of them, we can build uh, models and reporters that really allow us this, to do this ligase tracing in intact cells uh, in, in a time resolved manner. Um, yeah, so these are the conclusions. It's uh, a second essay that is, uh, that is dependent uh, on predefining a particular ligase that you want to find uh, molecular glues for. It's target agnostic, not ligase agnostic. It's compatible with high throughput screening, uh, and it's amenable to many different culinary ring ligases. Uh, with that, I want to uh, close by thanking the people uh, that did the work. Um, you, this is a relatively recent picture of my lab, uh, and the two people I want to highlight here is, is Christina, who did most of the work of the first story, and Alex, who did most of the work of the second story. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions if there are some now or then uh, later in the Q&A. All right, thank you so much, George. We appreciate it. That was a fantastic talk. Um, as a reminder, please add your questions to the Q&A box and 
What we'll probably do is move on into Danette's talk now, um, our next speaker, and any questions that come into the Q&A box we'll be able to moderate at the very end of the session, okay? So thanks again to George. Um, our next talk is from Danette Daniels. She is the Vice President of the Protein Degrader Platform at Foghorn Therapeutics, which she recently joined. She was an early leader in the field of targeted protein degradation, pioneering approaches to monitor cellular kinetics of degradation, and most recently, co-developing a new protag modality. Prior to joining Foghorn, Danette has been R&D group leader of functional proteomics at Promega Corporation. And today, she's gonna to be providing a really nice compliment to George's talk and, and telling us about the considerations that go into validating degraders and bringing them all the way to the clinic. So thank you so much, Danette. Danette, you're muted. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Callie, for that introduction. And thank you to Target 2035 for this invitation and opportunity to speak today. So I'm going to talk today not only about the development and considerations for validating degraders, but then, as Callie mentioned, uh, bringing them into the clinic as, as medicines. There we go. So targeted protein degradation, um, really exciting area. Um, it's opening these new therapeutic avenues uh, for all of us, as, as Georg has really nicely outlined, uh, both in terms of molecular glues as well as protax. And we can really start to think about this degradation of these disease-causing proteins to expand our approaches, the possibility of targets, as well as the disease indications. Um, uh, as Georg mentioned, uh, excellent example with molecular glues and their application for oncology. And now even we hear news today about uh, successful trials with lupus. And we just expect that degraders are going to continue on um, in these different indications with many protax and molecular glues moving towards or in the clinic. Uh, we could have an entire lecture on this explosion of the diverse degradation modalities. Uh, while we're focusing today on degradation via the ubiquitin proteasome pathway, there are many ways to remove proteins. We can also think about removing extracellular secreted proteins, membrane proteins, different compartments, et cetera, and moving beyond small molecules to biologics, so antibodies or even nucleic acids to drive degradation. Um, but really, this most exciting part is this uh, being able to target now things we thought were intractable or undruggable uh, with degradation. And target 2035 is just an excellent um, support of this in finding probes for targets. And from those probes, as Georg mentioned, we can build, use them as the starting building blocks to design and develop degraders, which could uh, eventually become medicines. So when do you think about developing a degrader versus an inhibitor? Um, well, for us, it's really all about the biology. And it's this evidence that removal of these core disease driver proteins will halt or hinder cell growth and stop the progression of the disease. And you can initially assess this by uh, genetic knockout, so siRNA or CRISPR knockout screens. Um, but really to understand how a degrader would act, it's understanding this temporal degradation or removal. And this can be done if you don't have have a specific binder with tag fusion protects such as halo protect or D tag. Uh, we also understand, especially those of us that have worked in epigenetics for a long time, is that some targets simply, um, while we might have fantastic binders and specific binders, uh, those inhibitors alone are not sufficient for the desired outcome, or you have to use them at such high concentrations that toxicity becomes an issue. So degradation in this aspect is more powerful for uh, reaching that desired outcome. We also, as we expand and we think about targets and probes for many um, proteins, we realize that uh, we want to go after disease-causing proteins that have no enzymatic activity or maybe even uh, no defined domains. And, and these uh, 
were so nicely presented could be addressed with molecular glues. And lastly, again, uh, we work in this area of epigenetics. We have these large proteins. We can really start to think about using a degrader to disrupt those core scaffold proteins and destabilize the larger complex rather than simply block a component of it. So as mentioned, uh, we develop therapeutics, uh, which really impact uh, the chromatin and gene expression in disease. And just from a very high level here, um, uh, in healthy cells, you have chromatin remodeling complexes working in concert with transcription factors to be guided to the right regions of DNA to open them up and initiate normal gene expression. Uh, at Foghorn, we're focused upon the BAF uh, chromatin remodeling complexes, and we see, particularly in disease, just highlighted here in cancer, that there are these aberrations that arise in the BAF remodeling com uh, complex in oncology in that uh, components are lost uh, or there's rearrangement of, of subunits within the various complexes, and we can even see translocation fusion incorporation in associated with disease, which I'll get to later. All of this results in a chromatin dysregulation and improper gene expression that we want to use uh, and target to shut this down to uh, halt the progression of the disease. So to understand and the critical moments, especially in uh, the development of therapeutic uh, degraders or even inhibitors is really this target identification and validation. And we use what we call our gene traffic control platform to understand these uh, drug genetic dependencies, uh, particularly uh, upon the chromatin regulatory system. So we look for these dependencies. We look to find uh, which proteins are the cancers addicted to that, that we would go after as targets. And then where we really differentiate is that we work with these remodeling complexes in the context of the full complex. So we purify and reconstitute these large megadalton remodeling complexes at scale and, and uh, uh, have assays set up to understand how our compounds impact these complexes and their interactions. Uh, then we have just a really talented team of med chemists and drug discovery that optimize this chemical matter. I'll focus today on targeted protein de uh, de degraders, but clearly there are situations when inhibition uh, works extraordinarily well to shut down uh, these aberrant chromatin remodeling complexes, as well as small molecules, which disrupt key uh, interactions with uh, transcription factors. And then the last piece of this is really that translation to the clinic and the identification of the biomarkers, the understanding of the patient population and where these uh, therapeutics will be most impactful for the treatment of disease. So I want to step back, as, uh, as Kelly mentioned, we've had a long focus in this area of target protein degradation and um, looking at these kinetics and trying to understand what are the mechanism of action? So when we talk about targeted protein degradation, you hear people saying all the time, it's event-driven pharmacology um, rather than occupancy-driven, which uh, we, we describe inhibitors. And that's because it's a multi-step complex cascade. You have your degrader entering here. I have a depiction for protax. Uh, they're they're uh, heterobifunctional molecules, so they have a warhead for the E3, a warhead for the target. They can actually go and bind those separate complexes, but what you really want is this formation of the ternary complex. You want it in an active E2, E3 that successfully and very efficiently ubiquitinates that target, so it's positioned perfectly and drives through to degradation. But what you have even in this simple schematic, is competition at every step. And this competition is working against uh, your drug action. And if you think about this even more holistically, this can now be cell type dependent, uh, dependent on the expression of the machinery for all of these components or the cell permeability that different cells uh, exhibit and 
and the location of these. So we have these numerous dynamic processes in place. And uh, really the focus of our, uh, our approach is to understand uh, the whole process of degradation and this full kinetic profile. So oftentimes you see uh, talks uh, for target protein degradation and they treat the cells with the degrader, they measure this Dmax. So what is the, the total amount of degradation that can be achieved? And, and this is, uh, sometimes that the end of the story that you hear. But if you think about the full profile, you have indeed this treatment at a concentration and the Dmax, but eventually uh, you will get some level of recovery. And there is a degradation rate that gets you down to that Dmax. There's a time at which the Dmax occurs. There's a time at which the recovery initiates. There'll be a rate of recovery and there will be potentially a return uh, and it may not be to the level of, of the target that you had before you even started the degradation process. But the great news is that we can start to think about monitoring all of these uh, parameters across the full profile and now use this information, this multivariate information, uh, to really rank order compounds in uh, unique ways and aid that chemistry and optimization which is such an upfront uh, portion of development of degraders. And just to show you some examples of how uh, we are thinking about this, and uh, this really is work that I did with my uh, former colleagues at ProMega, and we have a review coming out about the importance of kinetics here. But um, yeah, if you can monitor and follow these profiles, you can do, of course, the degradation versus concentration curves. If you choose a specific time, that's the DC50. If you don't choose a specific time for a concentration, you can determine the Dmax50 and just uh, plot the maximum possible degradation that could be achieved for any given concentration. But then you can start to think about graphs of degradation versus degradation rate. And now you're able to differentiate the slow degraders, which may be complete, versus the fast degraders. And it's always these fast degraders that um, we're more interested in. Likewise, you can plot the rate versus concentration, and you can see at what concentration am I achieving that maximally high fast rate. And then you can look across the full profile and calculate the area under the curve for any type of degrader at any given concentration and maybe capture multiple of these parameters, uh, including potentially that recovery that we're talking about. So um, we've looked at so many degraders over the years, calculated so many of these types of degradation profiles. As Georg mentioned, we do this not with Western blots because it, it's too much, but uh, using high bits, uh, endogenously tagged proteins, monitoring them continuously over time. But these were some of the most common types of degradation profiles that emerged from these larger studies. And I have here too, uh, the profiles that you love to see, the classical and the highly potent degradation profiles. Here you can see as you increase that concentration of degrader, you increase the rate of degradation, you drive down to uh, that uh, Dmax where all of your protein basically is gone and you hold that sustained uh, plateau of degradation. And for highly potent compounds, you can reach and have this broad range of degrader concentration that drives at that same high rate and that, um, that high Dmax across the broad range. So I'd like to ask the question here, if you're thinking or your degradation aficionado, are these profiles of molecular glues and or protax? Well, um, the classical you can achieve with molecular glues and protax, um, this highly potent where you have the, this broad range uh, of a fast degradation and complete degradation you see with molecular glues, and I'll talk about a little bit why more, but uh, um, with protax you only really see when you have this ternary complex favorability and cooperativity. And why is that? Because most of the times with protax, especially in early development, uh, you see what we call the protax hook effect. And this now is that decision point where the protax can come in and either go to form competing binary complexes with either the E3 or the target or this favorable ternary complex. And where we see the hook effect occurring first 
is in that rate of degradation. So we see when this competition starts to happen at the high concentrations, now we see the slowing of the degradation. And um, depending on the time you measure, this may impact that overall Dmax. Um, if you let it go long enough time, sometimes in, in this example, you can see that it comes down. Um, but this we see very, very frequently with Protax as you improve the ternary complex, you make it more favorable, more cooperative, more avid even, um, then you have less of this hook effect uh, that you see at these higher concentrations and more uh, concentration range with that fast and very high uh, Dmax. So other types of degradation profiles often seen, and this is especially with our early stage degraders, are partial degradation. No matter how much degrader you put in, you only see this kind of partial degradation plateau. These are really hard to interpret because they're actually due to, could be due to a variety of mechanistic factors. So poor permeability, poor efficiency of ternary complex or ubiquitination, or what we're seeing more and more reports of is target subpopulation degradation. So maybe only degrading a target that's in certain complexes or at different stages of cell cycle or different localization. So there's not always equal access uh, to the E3 ligase binding of all uh, populations of your target. And we also want to appreciate the recovery, right? So uh, there are some cases for targets. This is a kind of an extreme example, but you can be very efficient at degradation, but the target does not remain degraded for long. And this could be due to internal mechanisms or feedback loops that want to return the target to its original protein homeostasis levels. So you have that competition, even with the degrader present, uh, to return the target it to its original levels. Uh, if you see vast recovery too, it could also be that the target is not stable or hydrolyzed inside the cell, or as we've seen reported recently, high efflux. So it's rapidly pumped out and no longer working. So those, these are um, just a, a glance at kinetics and, and how kinetics can help you understand the compounds that you have beyond just the degradation Dmax, but also insight into the mechanistic. But uh, one thing I loved about Foghorn, I've only been here as mentioned for a few months, but they have really set the time in the very early days uh, for therapeutic degraders of building this excellent uh, heterobifunctional degrader platform to bring compounds to the clinic. And we have all of these stages, and yes, there's a cycle here within these phases, but eventually you get to the optimization of the degrader drug properties, that PKPD relationship that you need that, and, uh, to understand uh, also how to administer the drug and dosing schedules. So I'd like in this last portion of the talk to really go into a, an example of uh, our, our uh, degrader, which has entered the clinic, and that's the degrader for BRD9. So going back to the biology, I just want to talk about uh, synovial sarcoma and this finding that over 90% of synovial sarcomas contain this uh, translocation fusion between SS18 and SSX. And we find that this translocation fusion now is incorporated inappropriately into uh, BAF complexes. And when we looked within synovial sarcoma to see which proteins are associated and have this dependency related, uh, we find that BRD9, which is a component of the non-canonical bath, which also contains this translocation fusion, is required for the survival of the synovial sarcoma. And so it was the BRD9 that we decided to go after and a lot of foundational work too by the Bromo domain community, including the SGC. There was uh, existing binders already, very specific binders to the BRD9 Bromo domain. And we were able to use this as the starting platform for development of a degrader to BRD9. So uh, we went ahead and developed uh, the PROTAC to BRD9. Here now we're testing in relevant uh, synovial sarcoma lines. Uh, we have uh, two assays determined. One is a nanolook assay with BRD9 that allows you to read this loss of luminescence. We see a DC50 in the picomolar. We can also expand and do this assay in several synovial sarcoma lines using antibodies. 
of just the, the endogenous protein. And we, we see, again, this double-digit picomolar uh, DC50 values. Um, getting back to that kinetics, we can treat here now 15 nanomolar, and we can look over time, how, how rapidly in these synovial sarcoma lines does BRD9 loss occur? And we see this rapid loss within hours of nearly the complete population of BRD9 and that hold down um, at, 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 of loss over time out to 24 hours. Uh, we then did uh, global proteomics to look and ensure that indeed it was specific for BRD9 degradation. There's a related bromo domain, BRD7, um, and we did not see any change of this, nor did we see any change of any other bromo domains. Uh, but we do uh, proteomics at four hours, also at 24 hours, though that's not shown here. And we see this very specific loss only of BRD9 in these unbiased proteomics experiments. But so then the exciting part for us was really moving to in vivo. And now we have uh, the synovial sarcoma um, uh, model in mouse, um, and we treat the mice in a single dose IV at varying concentrations. You can see as we increase the concentration here of FHD609, we can see the loss of, of BRD9 in the mouse um, in our synovial sarcoma line. And we see this. Um, at rapid at four hours and sustained over several days within the mouse. And then the last piece here is looking at tumor volume and uh, our ability to kind of figure out here the dosing schedule and also show this inhibited tumor growth. And we're able to look at a low dose, a weekly dose versus a, a weekly dose at a slightly higher, the 3.5 mix per kg. And we can see at this, even with a weekly dose, we can keep the levels of BRD9 down low. And we see this very low uh, tumor uh, growth, so inhibited tumor growth, that, which is dose dependent. And we are able to then gauge this level of loss of BRD9, the sustained loss of BRD9 uh, necessary for that inhibition of tumor cell growth. So just to wrap things up, uh, broadly, on target protein degradation, it's really, exciting area has been so exciting over the last several years, but it's opening the doors to many new therapeutic targets, many new diseases that we, we couldn't, we didn't think we could approach before. Biology is the driver of choice when you decide, yes, I want to degrade this target and degradation is going to be very effective as compared to other modalities. And you need this really robust mechanistic validation not only critical for triaging, but optimization and characterization of compounds to really advance these therapeutic programs. And on our side of a degrader to the clinic, uh, our, our FHC 609 is a BRD9 degrader with picomolar potency that shows the sustained degradation of BRD9, both in vitro as well as in vivo. And in our uh, Xenograph models of synovial sarcoma, we see this robust uh, tumor growth inhibition even with weekly dosing. And uh, FHC609 is in currently is in a phase one clinical trial for synovial sarcoma. With that, I really like to acknowledge uh, the team at Foghorn uh, for welcoming me. Um, and, and I'm so excited to be a part of the team. Again, fantastic divisions, both in biology, chemistry, and drug discovery, as well as CMC. And I'm currently hiring uh, to build our degrader platform. So please reach out to me if you're interested. And also really like to thank my colleagues at Promega Corporation, who I worked with um, to really spearhead this kinetic analysis and mechanistic understanding of degraders um, uh, previously. So with that, I can take some questions. All right, fantastic. <clears throat> so Danette, would you like for me to read the questions out of the Q&A for you? Sure. Okay. So the first one is, um, does Foghorn consider cancer resistance to degraders in the clinic and remedies for this? Yes, uh, this is a very important uh, consideration, and we definitely want to understand uh, where that resistance will arise uh, with our degraders. 
in terms of remedies for this, I, I don't have an answer for you yet, um, but, we, but we are studying this. Fantastic. And then another one that says, if a Protac or glue drug shows a rapid degradation and rapid recovery, will it still be useful in clinical potential? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it really depends on the mechanism that's driving the recovery. If it's due to compound instability um, or maybe uh, unfavorable ternary complex or, or something like this, those are properties inherent to the chemical compound degrader that you could potentially optimize. If the cell is just rejecting the state that your target is degraded, and has things to override it, transcriptional and translational control, something, uh, you will have a very difficult time, you know, maintaining such high levels of drug at all times to try to keep that degraded. Yeah, great answer. All right, a reminder to add any additional questions if you all have them, but the next two seem a little bit broader, so I'm gonna pitch it to you and George, and y'all can decide who would like to answer it. The first one is how to find tissue-specific E3s, which would help reduce toxicity and increase efficiency. Um, also, any other better E3s identified recently than VHL and CRBN? Do you want to start or should I? You can start, yeah. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> so maybe to start with the second part of the question, I don't think that there is any that are quote unquote better than Cerebron or VHL, particularly in terms of potency of, of the molecules that have been described. Um, I think the general notion that there would be advantageous to hijack also other ligases, some of which might be tissue specifically regulated, uh, that has been out there for a while. So I think it's certainly a, a goal worth pursuing. Um, I think chemoproteomics has over the last couple of years, you know, spearheaded by work from Ben Kravat's lab, then Nomura's lab and others shown that it's, it's very primed to find chemical matter that engages new ligases. And I think if you just run your chemoproteomics platforms in particular cell types, uh, then you might get lucky and find chemical matter that engages an E3 that is spe specific for this particular tissue type. And, and I think that the assay that I introduced introduced uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, that would also work, um, you know, where you just maybe a priori determine using available data, you know, single cell sequencing data and so on and so forth, what are ligases that are selectively expressed, and then you engineer your cell lines so that um, you can capture that um, and recapitulate that. I don't know, Danette, if that was complete or if there's anything you want to add. Yeah, I, th I think too, maybe one thing to add, um, bioinformatics databases are so fantastic these days. You can look at expression um, across an association also with disease and, and, and this to really, if, if you wanted to think about going after tissue specificity, um, that, that, that's one more thing, but it's, I think it's so open in what you could choose or, or choose to work with, um, that the question becomes then finding chemical matter, um, and, and ways, creative ways to find the chemical matter to those E3s. Awesome. Okay. Next question. Are any people using the high bit KI method to check protein half-life? And will this work compared to the traditional method? Yes, uh, they are. We've actually used it also. Um, but we've done this really with the more traditional cyclohexamide experiments uh, to look to see how quickly does, um, if, if you pause that um, new protein synthesis, how, how over time, uh, what is the loss of, of your targets, your endogenous targets? All right. Another question, if the degrader partially degrades, how to address if it's rapid and complete degradation? Yeah, I, I can address this one as well. Um, for rapid, you would just test very early on and understand um, how, how quickly that loss is occurring. Uh, for the depth of degradation, that would just be a comparison against the starting. Um, uh, 
levels. I would say how to improve upon it. You know, that, that's a, typically a chemistry question, but understanding how permeable your compounds are is pretty critical, especially when working with Protax. You may want to choose a different E3 ligase handle or change linkers and such to really improve upon that, that initial partial degradation. Awesome. Okay. Are you aware of any degraders recruiting two or more E3 ligases to degrade the same target? And would this be a path to minimize resistance mechanisms? Yeah, I can, I can take that one. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I think it certainly would. Um, I think there, are, if, if that is to be engineered, you need to take care of a couple of um, things like, it has been shown that if you recruit two ligases to each other, that there is typically cross degradation, you know, VHL would start degrading Cerebron, for instance. So I think that is something that would need to be carefully mitigated in such a setup. But I think in principle, all the data out there would suggest that uh, there's not a whole lot of cross resistance that could occur if you could leverage two ligases uh, in, in parallel. So I think it's certainly um, a strategy worth pursuing. That's great. Okay, last question. My degraders worked well as inhibitors in drug sensitive cells, but not work well as inhibitors in drug resistant cells. Do you have any recommendations to investigate this? So this is similar to what you talked about, George. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure if he, he or she means that they are still working in, as inhibitors on top of acting as degraders, or if it, this is just inhibitors mm. here means just it's active versus non-active. Uh, I think cell um, uh, permeability uh, or drug permeability is something that I would, I would check here if this is cells that are, you know, grown to be resistant and sometimes they have these very high efflux pump levels that just pump out uh, small molecules and and I would I, I would check that first but I'm a bit um, yeah, I'm not entirely clear what the gist of that question is okay fair enough yeah maybe maybe I can address that also and it's related to Alex's question from before um, Oftentimes resistance uh, to degraders does not happen on the target. It, it's more on the side of the E3 or the machinery components and the, the, um, the E3 complexes. But um, work uh, that we did with Nathaniel Gray's group showed that resistance can occur on the target. Um, and it was different resistance to the target that the, the, just the inhibitor alone resistance was. But one of the outcomes of that resistance change was a reduced capacity to even bind uh, to the PROTAC. And, and that's why you might see it stop working as an inhibitor in drug resistant cells. It just can no longer bind um, uh, on the target binding side. All right. Great questions, great answers. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, oh, one more came in and we've got a minute, so why not? How would you check the permeability of Protax? Okay, yeah, this is good. Well, you could, for instance, set up like a PRM assay. So you could do mass spec in, in, in cells and then see how much you recover after treatment. Or you could do something like a SETSA assay, but that then rather measures target engagement as a proxy for cell uh, availability. Yeah, we use, of course, uh, nanobread target engagement uh, to look at binding directly to the E3s in permeable eye cells versus live cells. That, that's also one way to do it. All right, fantastic. Well, with that, I'm going to thank everyone for being here today. Thank both of our fantastic speakers. We really had a goal of presenting a webinar that not only helped you understand how new molecular glues are and degraders are identified and characterized, but also taking it all the way through to the clinical side. And I think that this was a really great way to do that. So thank you both for your fantastic talks and to all of you for your great questions. Um, if you missed any part of the presentation, it is being recorded and will be posted um, online in the next couple of days. So you can check target2035.net for that recording and share it if you'd like to. I do want to point out before we wrap up that the next Target 2035 webinar is happening on June 14th 
on the topic of automated chemistry. And it will be hosted by Adam Nelson, who is at the Rosalind Franklin Institute. And again, target2035.net for all of the details on that webinar. So again, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Target 2035, for organizing and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.